Hola, soy Elder Favarín. Gracias por escuchar este podcast. Espero que te inspire y te haga reflexionar. It is so special to be with you all. What a joy, what an honor to serve Jesus and serve you here at Keswick. Thank you, James, very much. Thank you all for such a warm welcome. And I have to say, I have been excited by your enthusiasm. It even reminded me of the excitement uh, Little Grow was experiencing when she was about to be baptized. Well, I also send you greetings from Anna, my wife, and our four children, Mateo, who is 11, Raffaello, who is nine, and we wanted a girl. She did come, Valentina, but brought a brother with her, Pietro. They are twins. They are six. And I also have some uh, greetings that they send you. If you can watch it, please. Hello, I'm Mateo. I'm Rafano. I'm Valentina. I'm Pietro. Hi, everyone. We are praying for you for the fondness and God bless you. Can we play it five more times, please? <laughs> well, a number of you have asked where I am from, which I have to say surprised me. I thought they would pick my Oxford accent. <laughs> but I am Brazilian by birth, also Italian by nationality, lived in Mexico all my teenage years. Then after getting married, Anne and I came to the UK as missionaries while I was doing some studies as well, where we lived for two years in England, four months in Scotland, then we were sent as missionaries to Spain 13 years ago. And just a month ago, because of my uh, responsibility, uh, we moved to the US. So I have to say that this country has had a tremendous impact in our lives and in our ministries. And I want to make the most of this opportunity to once again thank you for that. Uh, and by the way, my kids also have asked me to express their gratitude, particularly for Mr. Bean. <laughs> they really enjoy watching him. And in addition, I bring you greetings from uh, CBS, Community Bible Study, a global family. Now imagine you and I were having a delicious cup of tea and, and, and a marvelous scone. I really miss your scones, I have to say. And you were to ask me, Elder, if you compare the places you've lived, which one would you prefer? Of course, I would say, I won't answer. But <laughs> comparisons, comparisons often bring two or more elements together and evaluates which one is better than the other, right? For example, if I asked you, would you prefer coffee or tea? Or which football team is better? Manchester City, United, Liverpool, Chelsea. Which country? England, Scotland, Wales, Northern Ireland. No, we won't go there. I'm just joking. But I say this because the author of Hebrews makes use of various comparisons to make one main point in his most possibly sermon. Jesus is better. Jesus is superior when compared to various others. After a profound introduction in this epistle, highlighting the supremacy of Christ, which by the way, James Robson expounded yesterday with such excellence. Thank you once again, James. Hebrews says in verse four, so he, Jesus, became as much superior, and this is the translation of a Greek word that can also be translated by better or greater. And this is one of the author's favorite words in the book of Hebrews. He uses it 13 times. 13 out of the 19 times the word appears in the New Testament. The author is expressing Jesus is superior. Jesus is better. Jesus is greater. And the first four chapters of Hebrews that we are navigating in together these days will tell us that Jesus is indeed greater than the prophets. Jesus is greater than the angels, greater than human beings. Jesus is greater than Moses, greater than Joshua, greater than Aaron, greater than any high priest. And you and I also know that Jesus is greater than the devil, than sin, than death, than our fears and 
traumas and crises and political and economic instabilities. And that Jesus is greater than religion, greater than our theology. Jesus is greater than our imagination. Jesus is greater than all the revelation we have of him. Because God does not fit into our boxes. God does not fit into our equations. God does not fit into our ideologies. God does not fit into our philosophies. God does not fit into our songs. God does not fit into our churches. God does not fit into our denominations. Because from everlasting to everlasting, God is God. Jesus is greater. Hebrews is affirming. And we now have a greater covenant through him. Hebrews will show us. Verse 4. Once again, so he, Jesus, became as much superior to the angels as the name he has inherited is superior, is better, is greater to this. So after comparing Jesus in the introduction to the prophets, he is now comparing Jesus during a number of verses to the angels highlighting a very important message in this next section of Hebrews. Jesus is greater, superior to the angels. And this is another word that appears frequently in this epistle, angels, meaning messengers. And the author uses it 13 times in Hebrews. The only New Testament books that use it more often are Matthew, Luke, Acts, and revelation. And we will see that from verses 5 to 14, Hebrews will make a case based on seven quotations from the Old Testament for Jesus' superiority to angels. But before we look at those quotations, let me just highlight the fact that angels have generated curiosity among many of us And our societies have developed different perspectives of who the angels are and what their role is. I was reading that in 2005, Britons voted the popular song Angels by Robbie Williams as the song they most wanted played at their funeral. I wonder if you agree with that. Sri Chimoya, Indian spiritual leader, wrote a poem in which he says, In the last dark hour of the night, angels come to love us and awaken us. I was reading an interesting article by Kelly Richmond Abno uh, called Exploring the Heavenly History of Angels in Art. And she shows how the earliest artistic interpretation of an angel was found in the catacomb of Priscilla, a quarry used for Christian burials in the third century. And then the first known work of art showing angels with wings dates back to the fourth century, adorning what is known as the Prince's Sarcophagus, a marble coffin found near Turkey. Then contemporary artists such as Anselm Kiefer, a well-known German painter, painted this picture of an angel. And for example, Keith Haring, an influential American pop artist, painted this called an angel icon. And the audience of Hebrews seemed to think very highly of angels because of the comparison we are being offered in the beginning of the book to show that Jesus is prominent, is superior. And I must confess, maybe you are thinking the same. I, I wonder why. It, it seems obvious to most of us, I think, that Jesus is better than the angels. But uh, allow me to remind you of the context. This is important. Jews, the audience of Hebrews, in the New Testament time, believed that angels were mediators of the law. God gave the law through the angels. This was not clear in the Old Testament books, but the idea was developed. For example, Act 7, 53, Stephen in his speech affirms, you who have received the law that was given through angels, but have not obeyed it. Or Paul 
Galatians 3.19 affirms, the law was given through angels and entrusted to a mediator. In addition, they would know several references in the Old Testament that speak of angels and formed their view of these supernatural beings. They would know based on scriptures that, for example, angels are messengers of God. They were strong and protected God's people. They could take human form and not be recognized as angels in some instances. There were different types of angels. Seraphim, cherubim, Michael is referred as an archangel, meaning the chief angel in scriptures. Or Revelation also speaks of living creatures. And of course, we know of the fallen angels, including Satan and his demons. I was thinking of the probably longest conversation I've had with someone for about four hours. And this man was telling me how his wife would be possessed and would have a, like a child voice and they would engage in a conversation with this being that possessed his wife during a long period of time and the voice was maturing every time it took his wife. He didn't have that interpretation, though clearly in mind that is a fallen angel that is affecting their lives and they need liberation. Hebrews 1.14, however, gives us the clearest description, I would say, of the role of the angels. The end of the passage we are camped at, where it says, Are not all angels ministering spirits sent to serve those who will inherit salvation? The Bible is reminding us that angels are real. That they are sent by God, and that they serve the children of God. That's quite striking. God sends his angels today to serve us, those who will inherit salvation. Now, going back to the body of the message we are examining together, I want to highlight how between verses 4 and 14, we find how the author of Hebrews is making a case, is giving arguments to establish that Jesus is, in, is indeed greater than the angels, which was an important position to be embraced by those first readers or hearers of Hebrews. And it is important to us as well. And first of all, we will see how Jesus is greater than the angels because Jesus is the Son of God. Let's read again verses 5 and 6. For to which of the angels did God ever say, and here's a quote from Psalm 2 7, the first of the seven quotes in this part of Hebrews from the Old Testament, five of the seven come from the Psalms. Psalm 2-7 is being quoted. Then you are my son. Today I have become your father. Or again, and here's a quote from 2 Samuel 7-14. I will be his father and he will be my son. Now it's interesting and important to realize that the first quote was actually originally written about David. The second about David's son, Solomon. However, and we trust under the Spirit's inspiration, the author of Hebrews is approaching those passages with a messianic perspective, a Christ-centered interpretation of those passages, giving them an additional layer of meaning, saying it is true what was written originally about David and Solomon, but these passages are pointing to someone greater as well, Jesus. Inter interesting once again to realize that the word in Greek for angels, meaning messengers, can also be used for a human messenger or Jesus being a messenger. 
So the author is intentional in saying, it is true, both Jesus and the angels are messengers. Though Jesus is at the same time the message. But he is greater because he is the son of God. And angels are created by God. Jesus, who is God himself, is the son of God. And therefore, he's better than the angels. When Jesus was baptized by John the Baptist, one of the few occasions that we know he heard the voice of the Father audibly, who said, this is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. It strikes me that the Father's affirmation came before Jesus' ministry. He was about to begin doing what he was called and sent to do by the Father. Before healing, before liberating people from demons and fallen angels, before preaching the coming of the kingdom, before dying and being raised from the dead, before then the Father says, you are my son and I'm well pleased. Because our relationship is not based on your performance or accomplishment. It is based in our relationship as father and sons and son. And how important, by the way, to realize that being in Christ, God looking at us through Christ, the same is true to us. We are loved and embraced and accepted and valued as daughters and sons of God, not because of what we do, how much we have, or the number of connections we may enjoy. And just allow me to say as well that Hebrews quotes the Old Testament 40 times. It is about 15% of its content. So percentage-wise, no other book in the New Testament quotes the Old Testament more often. We find that the preacher of Hebrews is saturated with Old Testament content. He is thinking biblically about everything, as we should do as well. And we thank God for giving us this sermon, which is possibly the only sermon given at a church context we have in the New Testament. All the other sermons in the New Testament were preached to non-Christians. We do not have one single example of a sermon, of a message given at a church service, church gathering in the New Testament. Interestingly, Hebrews might be the only example as it refers to itself as a homilia, as a discourse. Same word used to the discourse, to the message, to the teaching in the synagogues. Therefore, This preacher is saturated with God's word and may now make a case based on the Old Testament that Jesus is superior to the angels, first of all, because he's the son of God. He is creator, not created. Secondly, Jesus is greater than the angels because the angels worship Jesus. Let's read verse 6 once again. And again, when God brings his firstborn into the world, he says, let all God's angels worship, worship him, Jesus. And this is a quote from Deuteronomy 32, 43. And aren't you reminded of that moment when the prophet Isaiah in the sixth chapter of his book says, in the year that the king Uzziah died, I saw the Lord. And then he describes this majesty and beauty and greatness of God. In a way, how Hebrews begins his writing or sermon. And then Isaiah says, and I saw angels around, seraphim, who before his holiness and greatness couldn't but worship God. And they were saying one after the other, holy, holy, holy is the Lord. The angels are worshiping him and are affirming, holy, holy, holy is the Lord. And the whole earth is filled with his glory. 
And then, my friends, in John 12, 41, we read, Isaiah said this because he saw Jesus' glory and spoke about him. Who did Isaiah see? God. He saw Jesus as well. The glory of Jesus and angels for some in this audience, perhaps the greatest creation of God, very highly esteemed by many. But Hebrews is saying, they are created and they worship the creator. They worship Jesus. And thirdly, in the remaining of this passage, I would summarize the argument by saying that Jesus is greater than the angels because of his incomparable authority. Verses 7 to 13. In speaking of the angels, he says, is it okay if I read read, read the passage again? Despite my funny accent? Verse 7. In speaking of the angels, he says, he makes his angels spirits and his servants flames of fire. Quote from Psalm 104, 4. But about the Son, a parenthesis here, the name of Jesus has not yet been mentioned in Hebrews. He is also building up an argument. He's talking about the Son, the Son, and only later on in chapter 2, he will pronounce the name Jesus. Anyhow, but about the Son, he says, your throne of God will last forever and ever. A scepter of justice will be the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has set you above your companions by anointing you with the oil of joy. And here we have a quote from Psalm 45, 6, and 7. He also says, In the beginning, Lord, you laid the foundations of the earth. And the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you remain. They will all wear out like a garment. You will roll them up like a robe. Like a garment, they will be changed. But you remain the same. And your ears will never end. Quote from Psalm 102, 25 to 27. Verse 13. To which of the angels... Another question as he's building up his argument with various questions. To which of the angels did God ever say, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet? A quote from Psalm 110 verse 1. In other words, Jesus, only Jesus has been given such incomparable authority. He is on the throne. The angels aren't. Nobody else is. He rules. He governs. He has all authority. As Jesus himself affirmed in Matthew 28, all authority. Can you imagine that? All authority. Do we trust that? All authority. Does it move us to evangelism and to world missions? All authority. Does it move us to profound convictions about God's inspired word? And thinking biblically about everything, including what it means to be human, our sexuality, politics, government, economics, our relationships, our marriage. Everything. Because all Authority, says Jesus, in heaven and on earth, has been given to me. And the author of Hebrews is saying, only Jesus can say that. He's infinitely more powerful than the angels. He is greater than the angels. I was concluding a masters in biblical interpretation at the London School of Theology, when Anne and I had the opportunity to stay four months with my brother and sister-in-law, Anna's sister, in Aberdeen, the north of Scotland, where the sun always shines. (laughs) Just like Granada, where we were living. We loved it there. We loved it in Worthing, England, where we lived as well. But in that period, we found out that I had a cancer, and I had to be treated at the Aberdeen Hospital with a surgery and one doses of chemotherapy. 
And I'm so deeply grateful for the fantastic work of the doctors and nurses at Aberdeen Hospital and how God used them. And I remember one particular day as I was undergoing chemotherapy, playing the guitar and singing to Jesus in Spanish, Jesus, eres mi buen pastor. Tú conoces mis caminos. Meaning, Jesus, you are my good shepherd. You know my ways. I had fears. Just three years before that, we had lost Anna's dad, who died of leukemia. I had uncertainties, but by God's grace, he was teaching me once again that he is on the throne. He is sovereign. Jesus is greater than. And the same is true. No matter what you are facing in this moment of your life, or we are experiencing as a church with capital C, as a nation or as a world. This is the sort of conviction that moves some people like a friend I made the other week, I was in the Philippines speaking at a conference and met EJ, a young Filipino pastor who also teaches at a Bible college. And he was telling me that most of his students are going out to islands of the Philippines where they can be killed for the missionary work they are going to do. And these are people in their early 20s because they trust that Jesus is indeed the one on the throne. Then they make that sort of decisions with their lives. And I will also never forget, after speaking at a youth conference in Brazil, something that had never happened to me up to that point, and honestly never happened again, occurred as I was finishing my talk, I made a quick prayer. And as I, as I closed my eyes, I, I saw an image of a young girl sitting on a closed toilet seat with open arms, long hair, and I could see cuts on her wrist and arms. And I sensed as the Spirit of God was saying to me, this girl has been cutting herself. She's tried to commit suicide, but I have stopped her because I have a plan for her life. I must confess, I wasn't too sure if that was indeed God and had microseconds to share what I'm sure we need to share with reverence. Really, this is God speaking. But I sensed it was indeed God, so I shared that with the audience and said, if you are here, please come and talk to me. Finished the meeting, went down the stage and a group of girls came to meet me and kind of left one of them. That girl was shaking so much she couldn't talk for maybe two or three minutes. Finally, she sat down, rolled up her sleeves, showed me her arms and said, I am that girl. And she continued saying the following, I have been cutting myself and one day I was about to kill myself. I was alone when suddenly I heard a voice Stop, don't do it. But I was alone. So I spoke to God and I said, if this is you speaking to me, now that I'm going to that conference, confirm it. And God confirmed it to her. The conference was the one I was speaking at. And the Jesus on the throne who became human, the wounded physician was reminding her and he reminds us, that he is indeed greater. He is greater than the angels. He is the son of God. He is indeed superior to the angels. The angels worship him. He is indeed greater than the angels. His authority is incomparable. He is on the throne. Therefore, chapter two begins. But that greater message, my friends, will be given to us tomorrow. For now, let's pray. Jesus, our Lord and our God, our friend, our savior, greater than the angels. We worship you and we love you. Would you please call people to acknowledge for the first time that you are who you say you are. And may those of us who need to experience the salvation that is in Christ receive the free gift of forgiveness. 
relationship with Christ, lordship of Christ in your life right now. Come to him, repent, and trust Jesus as Lord and Savior. To those who already follow you, Jesus, daughters and sons of God, would you please also call us to deeper waters, to a deeper conviction, to a deeper appreciation, to a deeper enjoyment, to a deeper commitment, despite pressures, doubts, crises, cultural forces, deeper in you, Jesus, so we may celebrate, build our lives upon, and then share with people across the UK and the world the reality that Jesus is greater. Thank you for your word. Thank you for this moment. Thank you for each other. Thank you for Hebrews. And above all, thank you for yourself, Lord. In your name, Jesus, who is greater than the angels, we pray. Amen. Hola de nuevo. Gracias por escucharlo. Te invito a que lo compartas con otras personas y que estemos conectados por las redes sociales. Que Dios te guíe y te dé su paz.